Our next story is about a St. Louis photographer from the very earliest days of the technology when they were taking what they called daguerreotypes. Thomas Easterly was a good photographer at a time when it was really hard to be a good photographer. But then at some point, people pretty much forgot who he was, and even some of his images were attributed to unknown. Well, not anymore. Not too long ago, Thomas Easterly was rediscovered. Researchers put together the story of the images and the man who made them. Thomas Easterly's photographs of early St. Louis were long considered important historical records. The aftermath of the fire of 1849 is one of his best known images. But scholars would later see much more than history here. And there would be a new appreciation not just for the photographs, but for the photographer. Thomas Easterly originally came from New England, where he made a living practicing and teaching the art of calligraphy. Sometime in the early 1840s, he took up the brand new craft of photography, which had been introduced in France in 1839 by artist Louis Daguerre. These first photographs, daguerreotypes, were made on a metal plate with a polished silver surface that was coated in chemicals. Even today, they are startling in their detail and illusion of depth. Millions of daguerreotypes of varying quality were made in America. It was a difficult process to master. Plate preparation, long exposure times, tricky development process, and then sometimes carefully adding color by hand. Thomas Easterly was one of the good ones. His talent would bring him success. His stubbornness would bring him ruin. But at the start, he was just one of the many caught up in the daguerreotype craze that was sweeping America in the 1840s. The daguerreotype was an amazing phenomenon to the, to the American people. Um, it, it found its most enthusiastic and its most loyal audience in America. Um, there was always a distaste here in a way for, for the fancy of the artist or the kind of artificial interpretation and this had uh, a quality of being a truthful representation. Reality itself uh, recaptured uh, on a silver plate. And I think that was a, a, just an amazing experience here in America as well as worldwide. The daguerreotype in America became a business as wide open as the country itself. By 1845, nearly every city had at least one and usually several daguerrean studios competing to make portraits of the local citizens. Others who took up the trade traveled the rivers and the roads to the small towns and the frontier outposts, setting up their equipment and hanging their banner wherever they could and staying as long as there were pictures to be made. It was America that took the art and science of photography and added the ingredient of commerce. And so we have locksmiths and jewelers and we have um, saddle makers and grocers and I mean, there are accounts of people going to their grocer to get staples and to get a daguerreotype portrait at the same time. Many dentists uh, in particular um, seem to take up the practice in that first decade and uh, kind of one-stop shopping where you could actually get a pair of false teeth and your miniature portrait made at the same sitting. In these early days, outdoor photographs are rare. Making studio pictures was hard enough. The challenges of changing weather and skies were extremely difficult and there was no money in it. And yet in Vermont, Thomas Easterly was taking his camera outdoors. This wasn't the work of a mere picture taker. This was the work of an artist. When we consider these things and, and we see this as a body of work, not just kind of one accidental event that occurred, but, but a body of views made possibly as early as 1845. I mean, they represent to us uh, possibly the first, certainly one of the first, serious, sustained efforts to broaden uh, the horizons of photography beyond its um, obvious usefulness for recording faces. 
But in other ways, Thomas Easterly was typical of the times. He became an itinerant Daguerreian, traveling first to New Orleans and then upriver. In Missouri, he photographed the Capitol in Jefferson City. And when he read about a sensational murder case in Rock Island, Illinois, he arranged to take pictures of the two convicted men before they were executed. That wasn't art, that was business. For Daguerreans were sort of the people magazines of their day. To attract business, they would often show off their best and most popular work in a sidewalk display or an inside gallery. When Thomas Easterly set up his first permanent studio on the second floor of this building in St. Louis, he advertised in a flyer what visitors could see in his gallery. Distinguished statesmen, eminent divines, prominent citizens, Indian chiefs, and notorious robbers and murderers. Here is dancer Lola Montez, whose performances and personal life shocked and fascinated proper society. But here, too, was the social reformer, Father Matthew, whose temperance lectures drew crowds in cities across the country. Popular comic actor George Yankee Hill posed for Easterly during a visit to St. Louis, as did the bearded lady from P.T. Barnum's traveling show. Easterly had photographed Kate and Maggie Fox, who had created a national sensation with their ability to talk to the dead, and later for admitting they were frauds. When a group of Sac and Fox Indians came to St. Louis, at least partly to appear in the circus, Easterly took advantage of the opportunity. But he did something others didn't bother to. He inscribed their names and information about them, and the year 1847. These are accepted now, I think, as the earliest dated photographic images of, of Native Americans. I think Easterly himself saw them as a treasured record of, of Western history as well. He also, of course, recognized their appeal, uh, their popular appeal. In St. Louis, Easterly could capture the entertainers and lecturers on tour from the East, along with the exotic and romantic figures of the Western frontier, displayed with dramatic titles. Thomas Forsythe, the mountain spy and guide. J. M. White, who was murdered on the plains by the Apache Indians. Don Santiago Kirker, King of New Mexico. He was um, known as the most um, formidable bounty hunter in the West. And we just sense him as a person, as a man, by his demeanor and his um, expression, who would be very well suited to the job as a paid executioner. I think that the Kirker portrait is, is just unquestionably one of the masterpieces of Daguerrean art. Easterly's daguerreotypes won top prizes in local competitions, but back east, it was another St. Louis Daguerrean who was known as the best in the West, John Fitzgibbon. He wrote for the National Photographic Journals, the ones that would be read by future historians. In all that he wrote about the Western daguerreotypists, he never once mentioned Thomas Easterly. Knowing what I came to sense about Easterly's personality, I can only conclude that he found the kind of politics of it all, uh, and probably the time involved in <laughs> promoting himself outside his locale, was something, something that personally was not, was distasteful to him, or that he was simply not inclined by nature um, to engage in. Thomas Easterly was still more interested in making good pictures than making good money. In the growing and changing Western city, he found a fascinating new subject and a new purpose for the camera. He sought out and documented the few log homes in the city left from the late 1700s, the rapidly disappearing vestiges of St. Louis's French colonial days. He shows an impressive structure of modern industry with a rare glimpse of the people living in its shadow. Here are the traders at the city's last operating slave market. Here, a cotton factory with children, possibly the workers, gathered in front. 
the image that's, that I feel is his finest is the, the German youth band. I don't know if it was posed or if he just got it out his window. I suspect he asked them at least to stop because the drummer is holding up his, uh, his drumstick. But it has the look of spontaneity that's almost impossible to get into Garrett This is America, tearing down and rebuilding, burning down and rebuilding again. Over a period of many years, he documented the destruction of the last of the Indian mounds, which had once dotted the city. He recorded the gradual transformation of what had once been a country pond into an urban sewer. We know of no other Daguerrean who had any interest at all in, in creating a, a record of, of the process and the consequences of urbanization. A man with such a sense of history must have known that he himself was becoming extinct. There were newer, cheaper, and easier ways to take pictures, but in Easterly's opinion, they were not better. Nothing he had seen could match the beauty of the daguerreotype, and he simply would not give it up. In this growing modern city, he insisted on using a frontier picture process. He was out of customers and out of money, and suffering from a long illness, possibly due to the continued exposure to mercury used in developing daguerreotypes. He died at the age of 73 in 1882, and he would fade from memory. But his images remained, many ending up at the Missouri Historical Society. And more than 100 years after his death, scholars would start to give him the credit he was due. We look again at his daguerreotypes, and we realize that he was right. Save your old daguerreotypes, for you may never see their like again. They will, doubtless, outlive you. Tia Meesterly, Daguerrean Artist.